the castle cast its hypnotic pull over any passerby who happened along to find it, tucked deep in the woods, in a place where no one would build a castle, let alone live in one. It served no purpose there, no strategy of war, no boast of wealth, no respite for a tired soul. Instead, it simply existed, tugging, coercing, entrapping. Its two turrets mimicked bookends, and if removed, one would fear the entire castle would collapse like a row of standing volumes. Windows covered the facade above a stone archway, which drew her eyes to the heavy wooden door with its iron hinges, the bushes along the foundation and the stone steps leading to the mouth of the edifice. Beyond it was a small orchard of apple trees, their tiny pink blossoms serving as a delicate backdrop for the magnificent property. Castle Moreau, home to an orphan, or it would be, Daisy clutched the handles of her carpet bag until her knuckles were sure to be white beneath her threadbare gloves. She stood in the castle's shadow, staring at its immense size. Who had built such an imposing thing? Here in the Northern Territory, where America boasted its own mansions, but still rejected any mimicking of the old country. Castles were supposed to stare over their fiefdoms, house lords and ladies, gentry, noblemen, and summon the days of yore when knights rescued fair maidens. Castles were not supposed to center themselves inside a forest, on the shore of a lake, a mile from the nearest town. This made Castle Moreau a mystery. No one knew why Tobias Moreau had built it decades before. Today, the castle held but one occupant, Tobias's daughter, Aura Moreau, who was 86 years old. She was rarely ever seen, and even more rarely ever heard from. Still, Aura's words had graced most households in the region, printed between the covers of books with embossed golden titles. Her horror stories had thrilled many readers, and over the years, the books helped in making an enigma of the reclusive old woman.